I would like to take the opportunity to introduce our next speaker, uh, Corey Zhu, who will be talking about modern JavaScript for Python developers. Um, Corey is a web developer and entrepreneur. After being the CTO of Tamaji from 2006 to 2017, Corey's moved on to his own side project, and he has an impressive list of them. Um, Corey got into Python in the early days of Django and hasn't looked back. Um, and without further ado, I would like to present Corey. Take it away. Awesome. Thank you. And I'm going to try to do the screen share again. Hopefully this works. Fingers crossed. Right. We see you. All right. Uh, cool. All right. Thanks. Uh, thanks, everybody. And, uh, and welcome. And yeah, so today uh, I want to talk to you about JavaScript. Um, my wife made me add a slide. I, I was just going to jump in, but um, David introduced me. Um, so I don't need to say too much here. But yeah, I was the CTO of a company called Tamagi from uh, 2006 to 2017. Uh, I remain the uh, top contributor to our main repository, which is a source of pride for me. I'm sure I'll get past soon. Um, and since 2017, I uh, sort of have become kind of a serial side project maker um, and entrepreneur. So I kind of make internet experiments and uh, try to try to sell things online. Um, yeah, so JavaScript. Uh, why are we talking about JavaScript at PyCon? Py um, and so your first reaction is probably JavaScript. And then your second reaction might be something like this, uh, which I won't read aloud, um, but but yeah, JavaScript kind of maybe gets a little bit of a bad rap in uh, in the programming world. This is uh, another one that you kind of see tossed around. Um, the joke being that there aren't very many good parts of JavaScript. And when I was just sort of googling for memes, I found this one, which uh, yeah, I don't really understand it, but I love how happy the Python guy looks. Um, so I thought I would throw it in here. Um, but yeah, so I think I think JavaScript, you know, can be stigmatized, especially by those in the Python world who think that Python is sort of the greatest thing in the world. Which, which you know, I, I actually, you know, I kind of believe, and probably a lot of us do. Um, but if if you're a web developer uh, in in 2020, um, then you probably need to use JavaScript. Um, it's everywhere. It's sort of unavoidable at this point. Um, and also, I will say that you know JavaScript, it's not so bad. <laughs> um, it's it's come a long way in the last uh, in the last ten or fifteen years since since I first started my um, my career in web development. And and I'll I'll show you a few of the a few of the things that you may or may not know uh, that JavaScript does these days and can do these days. Um, but yeah, once you once you wrap your head around it, uh, the modern JavaScript uh, ecosystem is. Is uh, and developer experience is actually is actually pretty pretty decent. Um, yeah, so in uh, 2008, when I first sort of started doing a, a lot of web development, JavaScript was pretty straightforward. It was sort of this thing that you put on your website when you wanted to uh, add some dynamic functionality, maybe like a little modal uh, or an auto uh, completion widget or something like that, and uh, you threw it on. Maybe they, maybe use jQuery um, that was kind of around back then. Um, but by and large, it was sort of this this relatively simple. Um, and for anybody who's tried to sort of get into JavaScript in 2020, it looks a lot more like this. Uh, you may or may not recognize some of these logos, all of these logos. Um, but essentially, JavaScript today is there's a ton going on. There's there's package managers, there's frameworks, there uh, there are entirely new versions of the language like TypeScript and and it's quite a lot. It's quite intimidating, uh, and especially as sort of someone who identifies as a Python developer, just kind of wanting to use JavaScript to to serve my sort of web development needs. Um, it was it was really difficult to uh, to sort of break into this world and, and figure out what all was going on here. Um, and so my goal is 
is to teach you, I guess, sort of what I've learned, um, hopefully what you need to know uh, in order to use modern JavaScript in, in your web apps in 2020. Um, and I'm assuming you, uh, like me, are Python developers. My, my background is primarily in Django. I've, I've built a few Flask apps. So a lot of the examples in this talk uh, will be based on Django. Um, and I'll say at the, at the top that this, this talk is based on a series of articles that I wrote. Um, and I'll link to those uh, in, the, in the discourse and, um, and in, the, in the slides. Um, so there's a lot more detail in there. So hopefully if I, if I go too fast or I, I cover things uh, that you don't, uh, but don't land, um, there's, you can always go back and, and refer to these articles where there's sort of a lot more detail, a lot more depth uh, to everything I'm going to talk about. So I want to kind of start by, uh, by sort of describing how most front-end code bases that I've worked on have evolved. Um, and so, you know, we would start out where, you know, for, for me, it's usually Django, um, but, you know, building out a site using your normal sort of Django or Flask tools, your, your, your views and your templates, um, you realize you need something dynamic to happen on the page. Um, and so you go to Stack Overflow, you find a little snippet of JavaScript that does the thing that you need. Um, you maybe add a script tag uh, to include some library from a CDN, uh, or maybe you, maybe you copy and paste it into your app, um, and then you go to one. And this, uh, you know, this, this isn't necessarily a bad thing, and for, for small projects, uh, this works totally fine. Um, if, if your project is not sort of too front-end heavy uh, or too large, um, this isn't too much of a problem. You can go pretty far. But as your project gets bigger, uh, this can create a lot of problems. Here's, here's an example from um, one of our uh, repositories at, at Demagi. Um, and this is, this is our base template in Django. So this is sort of the, the template that a lot of our other Django views, our, our other Django templates sort of inherit from. And you can see here, um, I don't know if you can see where my mouse is, but we, um, we have this pattern where we annotate the request object in Python to say which libraries we're using. So we say like, are we using MDD3, uh, which is a graphing library on this page? And if so, then include these four um, dependencies that MDD3 use, uh, needs. Or are we using data tables, which is a, a library that sort of does sorting and search for data tables? OK, well, then we need these three libraries. Or are we using type ahead? Um, and so you know, there are a couple of immediate problems with, with something like this. this uh, you know, first of all, you're loading a lot of scripts on your page, which is bad. Your dependencies are also sort of very far away from each other. Like this, this logic lives in some base template. Um, the thing that sets the, the use NDD property on the request is probably in some Python view code somewhere. Um, and then the logic that's actually using NDD3 is probably in a different JavaScript place altogether. And so and this is quite a common thing to happen to mature uh, or more mature Python apps as, as they sort of take this ad hoc approach to, um, to sort of JavaScript and JavaScript dependencies is they end up with with uh, a lot of this stuff sort of scattered around in different places. Uh, it's pretty hard to reason with. Um, and so I call this pattern server first. Um, and it, you know, it's, it's kind of you start with the with the web framework, with the sort of the Django world or the Flask world. Um, I, it's the most common one that that Python developers choose. And I, I put choose in quotes because you kind of you don't really choose this architecture. You sort of stumble into it over, over the course of months or years of, of slowly adding front end stuff to your app. Um, and in this world, as you saw, usually the JavaScript is included ad hoc at the page level. level. Sometimes that's, that's baked into your template hierarchy. Sometimes it's not. Um, and yeah, like I said, it, it sort of gets more and more unwieldy over time. Um, and another thing which we'll see later is you're, you're not really taking advantage of, of what JavaScript can do today. Um, so I kind of lovingly gave this the mascot of, of the spaghetti monster because, you know, not, not that your whole code is spaghetti, but your front end code base kind of gets spread around uh, all, all different places. And so it, it becomes a little bit spaghetti-like. So, right, so, so is there a better way to do this? And if you, if you sort of start from, uh, you know, 2020, I want to build my most modern, my best uh, web application that I can. Um, you'll probably end up finding something that recommends you do something like this. 
And so in this world, you basically, you create two separate, entirely separate projects. You have, uh, you have your sort of front end project, uh, and, and that might be its own entirely distinct code base. Um, and then you have your back end project. And the only way they know about each other and the only way they talk to each other is through APIs. Um, so these are often run by different processes. One might be running in Node uh, and one might be running in Python. Um, they might be running on two different uh, subdomains. And, um, and this is nice. Like uh, this, this has a lot of upside. It, it plainly separates your, your back end and your front end. Um, and that can be really good if, especially if you have a team and you have a team of, of JavaScript people and a team of Python people and, and nobody wants to sort of cross the chasm, uh, then you get this really nice uh, separation. Um, some of the downsides of this towards the bottom, like your, your backend basically becomes an API factory. And so like in the Django world, you know, you're, you're throwing away Django views by and large, you're throwing away all of the templating system. Um, similarly in the Flask, you're, in the Flask world, you're, you're not really using Jinja, Flask is just, is just serving APIs. Um, and for us as Python developers, you like when you're doing development on the front end, you, you lose that sort of like familiarity of, you know, oh, this is how I've been making websites for the last 10 years. And now you're asking me to like do this entirely new, totally different thing. And I'm only allowed to write APIs. Um, and so the result of that makes um, simple stuff more difficult. It kind of, it makes your deployment architecture a bit more complicated. And so this isn't always ideal either. Um, and certainly for me as, as like a single person doing, doing my own sort of like full stack projects, this, um, I, I didn't wanna sort of like take on all this weight when, when I thought, you know, why, why can't we just use these two things together? Um, so this one, yeah, I, I, I didn't have as good a mascot for this one. So I, I, I call it the Energizer Buddy. And the analogy is that um, you're bringing your own batteries, like you're, you're throwing out the batteries that are provided by the Python framework. And you sort of have to bring all your own stuff to the table. You have to re-implement everything um, in, in this sort of like new API pattern. Um, so this, I'm not going to read through all of this, um, but this, this is taken from the, the guide and sort of talks about the differences between these two. Um, and yeah, I mean, basically, one is kind of usually started by server developers. One's usually started by uh, JavaScript developers. They have sort of different properties around whether they use frameworks, how they manage the JavaScript tooling and all that. Um, and they both have pros and cons, but, but I have found that, that neither has been sort of ideal for me. Um, and so the architecture that I, that I like and the one that I use for, for most apps these days and, and that I recommend the most is, is what I call a hybrid application. And in a hybrid application, you, you basically mix and match these two things. And so rather than saying, you know, uh, my front end and my back end need to be completely decoupled or um, not taking any sort of uh, structured approach to, to organizing your front end code, you sort of mix and match these two things at the page level. Um, and what this allows you to do is take the power of modern JavaScript and, and there is good stuff in there, um, combine it with the familiarity that you're used to with, with your Python web frameworks and, um, and develop applications that uh, sort of sort of meet both sides. Um, a big downside of this is that you kind of have to dip your toes into JavaScript build tooling. Um, and that is not always the most fun uh, process. And so, yeah, so I wanna tell just like a short story of, of my own experience um, adding React to, to a Django project. And so this would have been sort of like, right when I stepped down into Moggy, I'm like building my first side project. I hear that this thing React is like all the cool kids are using it. I should be using it, and so I'm like, okay, I'm gonna like use React in this project. It's gonna be it's gonna be great, and so I go to the React, uh, you know, the tutorial, and they have this sort of hello world code, and you know, for those of you who who know modern JavaScript, like this this doesn't look too crazy. For those of you who don't, and for me at the time, what what am I looking at? Like what is what is that import? Like how, how does that import work? And, and where does that lab, like, I, can I even do that? And, and then you go down and you see this, this, you know, this H1, but it's, it, 
you think it should be a string, but it's it's not escaped by strings, and you're like, what what am I looking at? And if you if you put this code into a browser or into a JavaScript file and you try to run it, like it's it's not going to work. Like this isn't valid JavaScript code, and yet it's sort of front and center in the React Hello World, and and like my head is like kind of exploding. Um, but what I figured out pretty quickly is, oh, I, I need a tool chain. Um, and so, yeah, so why, why tool chains? And, and the short answer is, is so that we can do uh, new good stuff with JavaScript and uh, also support legacy browsers. And, you know, like I imagine a, a lot of us have gone through, you know, the Python 2 to 3 migration, and, um, and we all know how painful that can be. Um, in the JavaScript world, you don't really have that option. Like your your code needs to run on, you know, it needs to run on ideally, you know, seven or eight different browsers, you know, all these mobile phones, and and you have very little control of of what particular version of JavaScript is going to run on uh, any particular device that your code is running on, and so you have to be very defensive about it. And so the the way that the JavaScript community has uh, has gotten around that is they have introduced tool chains that essentially allow you to write newer, better, uh, easier to reason with JavaScript code. Um, and then they turn that code into something that browsers can actually deal with. Um, so that's what the tool chain does. That's, that's why you need it. It's so that you can do stuff like this and, um, and not have it crash on browsers when you open them. So, okay. So, I need a tool chain. What tool chain should I use? And and so the React documentation has some advice on this. And uh, you know, my first reaction was kind of like, okay, this looks like a lot of options. Um, but okay, I'm integrating with an existing code base, so I'll go check out this more flexible tool chain section. Um, and so I go over there, and I'm I'm reading this, and I'm thinking like, okay, Neutrino combines the power of Webpack with the simplicity of Priest. And Nix is a toolkit for full stack. And like, I don't, I don't know what, like it, maybe this makes sense to, to you all or, or to somebody, but when I read this, I'm just like, what is like, what is all this stuff? And what, like, what are even these words? And like, why do they all sound so funny? And, um, and yeah, it's, it's funny. Like I, my first experience, like getting into this, this sort of like JavaScript world that I had never been a part of was like, it was very, humbling and sort of like it, it caused me to like have some kind of like you know am i like not like I, I thought i was like a professional web developer i thought i sort of like understood what was going on and then i'm reading all these words that that barely make sense to me um but it's it's not this complicated and and you don't really need to care about all these different options if, if your only goal is is to use modern javascript um i'm sure the javascript people have have very strong opinions about about these various tools but but you don't need to if you're just sort of trying to get something done. Um, and so, yeah, so these are the basic elements of a tool chain. And, and most of the tool chains will look something like this with, with possible replacements of these different uh, specific tools. Um, but essentially, you have a compiler, uh, you have a bundler, and you have a, a package manager. And I'll, I'll quickly talk about each of those individually. Um, so the package manager is the easiest one. And, and the one line answer is it's it's pit for JavaScript. Um, so this is the thing that will where you'll put your requests in uh, into a file. It you know you'll give it versions. It it manages your dependencies for you. It does your installations for you. Um, so it's 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 almost one to one with pip. It, npm does you know they both do other stuff, um, but you don't really need to worry about that. Um, in in the JavaScript world, there's two main packages man package managers, and uh, people will argue about which one to use. Um, but NPM is, is sort of the most popular one, uh, and it's the one that I recommend. Um, and I'll say, like, when I recommend these tools, it's, it's not from the perspective of, like, I know everything about JavaScript, and these are definitely the tools you should use. But these are the most popular ones, and you, you, you can't really go wrong uh, if you use them. If, if you do want to sort of Get really into this stuff. You can you can go read you know 100 articles about npm and yarn and decide which one you want to use. But um, but that wasn't something that I I felt the need to do. Yeah. So that's the package manager. Um, the next thing is the compiler, and the compiler is the thing that lets you write uh, that 
code like the um, H1 thing that we saw in the React example. Um, so it'll it'll take sort of new stuff that's been added both to JavaScript and um, extensions that that you know other people have come up with like TypeScript or, or JSX, which which I'll talk about in a little bit, um, and turn them into browser friendly JavaScript. So that's the thing that's that's doing the work of uh, translating the modern stuff into into the stuff that your browsers can can deal with. Um, and Babel or Babel, I'm not sure how to pronounce it, um, is is the most popular compiler out there, um, and it's it's the one I sort of recommend using. And then the last thing is the bundler, and and the bundler does it kind of does two things. Um, one thing it does is it bundles uh, your code, so it's it's pretty well named. Um, and and one thing that it does is it it manages dependencies for you, and and that's part of the bundling process. Um, so if you remember this example I showed, where we had this sort of you know all these different libraries were being included based on this property that was was manually set. Um, if you just use those those import statements in your JavaScript code, then your bundler will will figure out that you need those libraries. It'll get them for you. It'll get the dependencies of those libraries, but it won't it won't grab everything that's installed. And it it'll sort of figure out what it needs and then create a single bundle file. Um, and so the other thing it does is you know you see on this page there's you know twenty some odd different files that might get included. And, and this isn't even sort of a complete example, but it'll it'll take all that stuff and just put it into one file. And so if you have it all in one file, that's uh, fewer requests that your page has to make, uh, which will make your site more performance. Um, and again, there's there's a lot of bundlers out there, um, but Webpack is sort of the, the gold standard and, and the most popular one. So yeah, so that was a lot of information quickly. Um, but to put it all together, um, NPM is, is going to be our PIP. It's going to deal with all the libraries that we want to use. Um, Babel will take our modern JavaScript and turn it into browser-friendly bundle uh, JavaScript. And Webpack will sort of take all those things, bundle them together, create this one nice JavaScript file, and we can finally have a hello world. So yeah, so that's. That's a lot of effort, um, but but it is it is worth it, and it's 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 a one time sort of exercise that you have to go through, um, and and in the in the guides I have sort of very detailed instructions on on how you can do all this stuff, uh, set it up in in a Django project. Um, in terms of putting it into into a project, um, this this is a Django example, and so you, you sort of you you have that whole pipeline there. Uh, on the left-hand side, and then you just all you really need is that bundle file, right? So the then you just treat the bundle file as uh, as any other static file as you would an image or a CSS file, um, and then you do your normal thing with with views and templates, and um, and then you can use you can use any of this modern JavaScript directly in in a Django app or in a Flask app um, by only just sort of referencing this file and and having having this thing in place on the left to to create it um, yeah so in practice uh, this is one way you could you could structure that um, and so you'd have your sort of your modern JavaScript source files in in a project folder uh, I called it assets you can you can call it whatever you want and then you have some build tooling that takes those and outputs them into your normal um, Static files directory, and then and then everything works sort of the same way. Um, and this assets folder, it it's never referenced or used by Django, but it's it's used to build your front end source. Um, and and you could keep it outside of the project, but but I find that having it inside the project is nice because then you can sort of do everything at once. And and really they are sort of dependent on each other. Um, and yeah, so this this is what you know a, a single page React app then becomes in this sort of hybrid architecture that I mentioned. So you have your uh, your modern React thing over here. It goes through your pipeline, and then it gets included in your Django template just as a bundle like this. And you can see this like div ID root is in your template, and then the React thing knows to go render itself in your root template. Um, so yeah, hopefully that makes sense. I, I realize I, I, I sort of went very quickly through that. Um, but 
there is uh, a much more comprehensive example of this uh, in the guide, which, which, but that's that's the basic things of it, and then the rest is sort of you know how do you deal with auth and how do you deal with APIs and 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 all of that good stuff. Right. So, so why bother with all of this, right? So, like at the beginning, I kind of said it would be worth it, um, and. Uh, and it is like you you do end up in in a much better world in terms of in terms of your front end code base, um, and so what's the payoff? Like some some things, so like you can you can use the latest JavaScript frameworks, um, and and they are they are quite nice. Like um, you know, it's it's one of those things where it's it's a it can be you know a steeper learning curve to start working with them, but once you wrap your head around them and once you get comfortable in them, it they really do. Uh, Increase your velocity. Um, they, the, the experience of, of building UIs in, in some of these frameworks is um, is quite a bit nicer than than sort of your standard, you know, document dot you know get element by ID dot add event listener um, or or the jQuery version of that. Um, you get the dependency management, so um, you know you don't you don't have to do any of that stuff yourself. All of your JavaScript dependencies can be can be managed in in sort of this import export fashion that that I showed in the in the React example. Um, you get new features and convenient syntaxes, which I'll I'll show uh, a few. Um, and you get uh, you know there's there's a ton of sort of customization that that is not in just JavaScript, but people who have their own opinions about how to make JavaScript better, um, and you can leverage any of that stuff depending on. What you want to use, um, so yeah. So hopefully it it kind of gets rid of gets rid of your front end spaghetti. So yeah, one of the, one of the big things you get is is ES six, which is just like the sixth version of uh, ECMA script or something like that. But anyway, it's 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 like later versions of JavaScript, and it's hilarious. Like basically, they just like added a bunch of features to make JavaScript more like Python, um, but they are useful. Uh, so one thing they added is arrow functions, which are basically lambdas. Um, and while this looks, you know, kind of trivial in the same way that lambdas look kind of trivial, like you just change the syntax of this function thing. Um, when you write a lot of single line functions, then um, these become really useful. And and I'll show you on the next slide, you know, why why you end up writing a lot more single line functions. Um, classes. You know that's a that's a novel concept, um, but but yeah. So you know, ES six adds classes to JavaScript. Um, the constructor is basically your init dot uh, or not your init function function, and um, yeah, and and these work sort of how you would expect. Um, they have something called template strings, which are basically f strings. Um, so the syntax is is similar to f strings, except they add a little dollar sign here, um, but you can essentially put, uh, you can escape this, you know, name variable in brackets and it'll render appropriately. And, and like F strings, you can, you can put sort of like arbitrary uh, uh, JavaScript code in here, um, like one line JavaScript code. So uh, you can do a lot of much more powerful string formatting than sort of the, the traditional like string plus string plus string uh, thing that, um, that we've been doing for so long. Um, and default argument value, so also just sort of like something that's been in Python forever. Um, but yeah, so you can have uh, optional arguments, uh, and instead of being undefined, which they would be in JavaScript, uh, they will get assigned whatever the default value is. Um, and, and there's a bunch more stuff as well. These were just some of the, the highlights that I pulled out. Um, another thing, so this this is kind of a, a React thing, um, but is so so this this is that H1 thing that I showed you uh, a, a while back. But essentially, it's it's a language called JSX, and it's kind of like string templating for HTML. Um, and it's it's funny at first, and it takes some getting used to, um, but it it is really nice in that it it provides a really Easy way to sort of write code that looks like HTML, but add business logic inside of it that can do complicated functions. Um, and so this would obviously uh, render, you know, hello, uh, what is it, Harper Perez, um, on your page. And um, 
this is one place where uh, where those arrow functions are useful if if you want to do um, complicated bindings and other stuff in in these templates, then um, you end up using a lot of sort of one line functions. Um, Vue, uh, which is another popular JavaScript framework, has a different take on this sort of. A lot of these frameworks, what they're trying to do is they're trying to make it easier to combine HTML uh, with uh, your styles and with your business logic. And so Vue defines this format where uh, the Vue file is broken into three parts. There's a template, which is kind of the equivalent of HTML. Um, there's the script area, which defines the uh, the business logic in here of, of you know what's actually gonna gonna happen with your data, and then there's styles that get applied. Um, and and one nice thing about the, this view example is these styles can be scoped, which means that this um, the style will only get applied to the P's in this file. Um, so it's a nice way to to um, to avoid having clobbering your global styles uh, for for a particular component. So again, this this is. It becomes a nice way to uh, to build UIs in in sort of a way that the whole UI is contained together rather than sort of being out in, in a bunch of different places. Um, and yeah, and that's honestly that's that's really the tip of the iceberg. I, I feel like I know maybe you know this this top part of the iceberg as well. Um, but there's there's a ton going on in the JavaScript world these days. Um, modern JavaScript is actually not so bad, um, and I encourage you to use it and and bring it into your Python projects. Uh, yeah, thanks. And so, yeah, like I said, if, if you want to see sort of code samples and, and anything else, uh, you can go to sasspegasus.com, which is um, one of my side projects, and then just click Guides, and um, you'll find like a super long write-up on all of this stuff. And if you want to find me, I'm Sizu on Pretty much everywhere, but but especially Twitter and and the ZA Tech Slack. Cool. Thank you very much, Corey. <laughs> Um, that has made, uh, oh, this is quite loud. Oh, yeah, there you go. That's enough. Uh, that's made JavaScript to an absolute novice like me, uh, at least recognizable. Um, and I see we have a bunch of questions and we have some time for questions. Uh, I have one question, which is any reason for not looking at Angular? Uh, no, I, I think if I was going to put if I was going to put a third framework in that in that diagram, uh, it would have been Angular. Um, I have the sense, and and this might be sort of the the JavaScript influence on me, but I have the I have the sense that Angular is sort of uh, a little bit on the decline these days, and and React and Vue are um, are sort of still on the rise. Um, but I'm aware that that Angular for a long time was was the default, um, especially you know, project. Uh, Integration. I know um, Vue was created by one of the lead developers of Angular 2. And so when the Angular 2, Angular 3 fork happened, um, a lot of the people who didn't like where Google was taking Angular 3 uh, hung around Angular 2 for a while and then jumped ship to Vue, which, which uh, people say is sort of like, like a better version of Angular 2. Um, but but yeah, that's that's my short answer. I, I have used Angular, and uh, I, I don't have anything too bad to say about it. Cool. Um, next question. Any ideas for server-side rendering of the dynamic JS code in addition to the Django template code? Yeah, that's, that's something that I don't know enough about, actually. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to admit my, my ignorance there. Um, I, I have the sense that if you get into that world, you you need to to be back in the Node.js world. Um, but I'm not I'm not too sure. Uh, we've we've kind of uh, reached reached the limits of of my knowledge on on server side rendering. Cool. Um, uh, next question: Is there a better way of integrating with Django Admin Run Server other than 
run this npm command in a separate shell. <laughs> yeah. Um, yes and no. Um, there, there are libraries that attempt to uh, solve that problem for you. So I think there's something called like Django View Loader, for example, um, that that tries to uh, dynamically sort of compile and and put a view. Uh, like a like a view pipeline into like directly into a Django template. Um, I, I found that uh, the npm flow has been has been totally fine. And as a personal preference, I, like I like sort of using the bare metal tools because I find that often these these libraries that have been written specifically for Django, um, like they work really well as long as you don't have a use case that they haven't thought of. And then and then the moment you sort of break out of uh, break out of that, it, um, they can be really hard to, to configure and troubleshoot and, and you, you end up wishing that you had sort of just, just started with the, the bare bones tools. That's, that's my experience. Um, but, but I, I haven't, um, I haven't tried a, a ton of, of other ways. I've never felt the need to, to find a, a better way to do that. It, it, it's good to know, uh, it's good to know where, where things are dangerous. Um, <laughs> and I, I should say that, that, it's easy to have, you know, the equivalent of of um, like how run server auto reloads. Like it's it's equi it's easy to have that set up in your npm. So you just you can watch for changes in in your JavaScript files, and then the experience is quite the same. You just you're just running two processes instead of one, um, but you don't have to like rerun the npm command every time you change a JavaScript file. Yeah. Uh, cool. Uh, next question. Have you ever used, uh, or do you know about Dash? If so, do you have an opinion? I have heard of it. I have never used it, and so I do not have an opinion. Cool. Um, but another question. Uh, how do one test a view component? Every time I touch it, I'm, I miss PyTest. Yeah. I... You know, my, my experience with Vue is somewhat limited. I, I have the sense that um, that you there is sort of a, a canonical answer to this. And if you if you go into the Vue docs, there um, they they have opinions about that. But I don't, off the top of my head, um, know what the answer is. Um, fr front end testing is is another one of those things that um, is a big. Uh, Initial investments, um, and I I haven't managed to get over the hump on all of my projects. Um, but but once you once you get it all set up, um, then then the experience of writing front end tests is not so bad. Cool. Um, then uh, is ES six still full of foot guns, like letting you pass <laughs> more arguments to a function than it accepts? I like the expression foot gun. Um, it's great. Yeah, like I so I know that they have sort of strict mode, and I believe it is intended to um, catch a lot of those things. Also, sort of like a lot of the common gotchas of of JavaScript, um, like you know, scoping variables properly and um, and things like that. So I I think you can sort of you can run your um, build pipeline in strict mode, and it will catch a lot of those things for you. Uh, I don't know specifically about that one, um, and, and whether that's something you can sort of set a rule for. Cool. Uh, and one last one, I think, which is uh, Redux. Uh, have you used it, and is it worth using? Um, I have. Dabbled in it on not on my own projects, but but for other projects, it's my. I think it can be worth using if for for a big, complicated React object or uh, project. My sense is it's just like a giant, global state dictionary, um, and so like for people who know React, one of the annoying things is you kind of have to, like, pass state around um, and push it up and down between. Uh, like parent and child components, and I think Redux sort of says like, no, this application has this global state, and everything can have access to it. And so, if your if your workflow, um, if that sounds like it would be useful for for your workflow, then I imagine it's it's worth looking into. 
um, for for small applications, I haven't had the need for it. Cool. Um, I think we've uh, is there some people typing. I don't know if there are any more questions. Or... Oh yeah, no. Thank you very much, Corey. Uh, awesome. It's been very Thanks, en enlightening. Uh, yes. Uh, I believe we now have a short break uh, before uh, the lightning talks, which will be in room one. So, Corey, thanks again. Thank you, everyone, for listening. Um, see you all at the lightning talks. Thanks, everybody.